โมทัสสะภะคะวะทะวะระหะโตสัมมาสัมพุทธัสสะนะโมทัสสะภะคะวะทะวะระหะโตสัมมาสัมพุทธัสสะนะโมทัสสะภะคะวะทะวะระหะโตสัมมาสัมพุทธัสสะปุถังธรรมังสังขังนามัสสามิเราเริ่มเริ่มเริ่มเริ่มเริ่มเริ่มเริ่มเริ่มเริ่มเริ่มเริ่มเริ่มเริ่มเริ่มเริ่มเริ่มเริ่มเริ่มเริ่มเริ
our moods, our emotions. And it's all sol solvable. And that's the message of hope that the Buddha gave us is that we can solve our suffering through cultivating the right qualities. And those qualities are the qualities that we develop through the Eightfold Noble Path, the fourth truth, in developing skillful conduct, speech, action, that supports the development of mindfulness, clarity, and wisdom on the inside. So it's possible to overcome suffering. Otherwise, the Buddha wouldn't have taught these Four Noble Truths, wouldn't have taught this way of practice. But it's something that we have to, we can only experience through cultivation of the right qualities. And in the beginning of practice, we need a lot of patience because straight away, we be, as we practice, particularly as we practice meditation, turn our attention inwards to watch our mind. We're seeing how, how much suffering and negativity we create from day to day, even from moment to moment in one period of meditation. Negative trains of thoughts rooted in greed and attachment, anger, hatred, fear, worry, and confusion misunderstanding of the truth these are kind of these kind of experiences are hitting us as soon as we meditate as soon as we <coughs> close our eyes <laughs> the negative emotions and the unskillful thoughts of the mind what you would call suffering comes straight up because we've been doing it for a long time since we were born we haven't been perfectly mindful and wise. We haven't been cultivating all the qualities of the Eightfold Path since we were born. So we have to accept that. But this is why we practice. And the Buddha's given us hope because he said, well, you can actually deal with these things and reduce the amount of suffering you're creating and actually end it. And that's... That's Nibbāna, that's the end, end of the, the path of practice is removing greed, anger and delusion from the mind. It can be done. Not only the Buddha has done it, but individuals since the time the Buddha lived, both men and women, they've done it. It can be done. So in the beginning, we have to have a lot of patience and a willingness to look at our own minds and bring up strength of mind to look, steadiness of mind, stability of mind, to be able to look and see clearly, to see how we produce suffering out of our experience. And particularly the unnecessary suffering where we just add on and add on and add on through not recognizing, not seeing the Four Noble Truths, you could say, not understanding what suffering is, where it's coming from, and how to deal with it. But the more we practice, the more we open up or awaken to the truth, we have a chance to see what's going on and change the production line of this factory. <coughs> and this, <clears throat> dukkha producing factory of the mind and to produce something better sila samadhi panya the basis for peace understanding and happiness so it's like we're coming in a bit like you know when they have those factories in the world that are maybe not doing so well and um losing money, maybe the production line is not very efficient or their products are old, out of date or whatever. And so they bring in all these new people to try and uh, uh, get a fresh start for that factory, improve the administration and the accounts and the production line so that it can be more useful and produce good things, good quality products and make a profit for the owners. 
It's a bit like that with our mind. You know, we're introducing the Dhamma now to try and re-establish our goals and the means to achieve our goals. So new ownership, or not necessarily new, new ownership, but new, a new production line, a new system, a new way of, of living. It's like introducing the Dhamma into your thinking and your way of going about your business in daily life. And as you practice meditation, you, the first thing you realize is how much we're just caught into endless trains of thought that are not guided by much mindfulness or wisdom, but more just by habit, habit of mind. And the habit is fueled by ignorance, craving, attachment, you know, the, the things that the, the Buddha identified as the causes of suffering. And as soon as you introduce, say, mindfulness and clear comprehension as you practice meditation, you get resistance because there's the old habits that are already, the habit patterns that are already established. And then you introduce mindfulness and suddenly it's like you're taking the mind in a new direction. You can say mindfulness, clear comprehension, wise reflection on the Dhamma, you know, these are still things that the mind produces. They're still sankharas, they're a form of karma, but the good karma. But of course it will clash with what went before. And so it sets up a tension or a resistance. And that's why often we find as we come to meditate, whether it's sitting, walking meditation, it, we feel it, it's tiring, frustrating, it's difficult. And often we create suffering out of meditation. Ajahn Chah used to say when he first began meditating, tried to watch his breath, he found it so frustrating trying to be mindful when all his mind wanted to do was think about things, things he loved, things he hated, go around in circles with the thinking. Or he tried to control the breath because he's so determined to, be, to concentrate his mind. He tried to control the breath, breath and got very tired and physically found it uncomfortable. And he laughed at himself. He said, oh, before I did meditation, I never had a problem with my breathing. <laughs> Being born and brought up in the world, I never thought about the breath, never had a problem with it. But as soon as I start to meditate, suddenly the breath is a problem. And this is an example of how we create suffering out of nothing, even in our meditation in the beginning because of our karmic conditioning, our habits, even something as simple as just paying attention to the breath becomes a problem. It can become physically painful, mentally frustrating, annoying, and the mind goes off looking for something else. And so we find it difficult in the beginning to practice. But this is giving you if, if that's the kind of experience you have, this is giving you insight into how we produce suffering in this mind. Maybe we have a goal. So when you come into meditation, you have a goal. I want a mind that is peaceful, not caught up in all its thoughts, feeling, I want a mind that experiences bliss. I want my body to be without pain. I want my mind to be totally without any kind of mental pain or anguish. We have the ideals because that's the way human beings tend to operate. We collect all kinds of ideals, concepts about our life and how the world should be and how our life should be and how our mind should be. We bring that into our meditation and then the reality is not yet matching the ideal. So already we feel frustrated, disappointed with ourselves. And the mind tends to go towards disappointment The Buddha was encouraging us to keep bringing out mindfulness because then we can have a chance to look at what's going on and not just judge ourselves as good or bad. 
just to look and get familiar with what is happening, the process by which we are producing suffering in our experience. And the more we can do that in a detached way, just look and know without judging, without getting too involved, and then there's a chance for us to start changing the habits, changing the production line. Instead of producing more stress and unhappiness, we can actually produce more mindfulness, kindness and wisdom, more useful qualities. And the more we learn how to do that by letting go, stepping back, letting go of the negativity, observing how if, if we do have mindfulness, we don't have to create so much suffering out of our experience. Even if we have physical pain on the outside or painful memories or unpleasant thoughts arising, we don't have to jump onto them and become caught into suffering with them. We can just observe them arise, pass away. If we can do that, then there's a chance. We can see there's a chance to reduce our experience of suffering and change our whole experience of life, of the world. So the Buddha was encouraging us to be at peace with the world through understanding and developing the qualities that will help that. And as you develop that more in yourself, then you can share that and encourage that in other people. And there's a chance to also bring some peace and understanding to the world on the outside. And so often we're working back to front. So we have some, something goes wrong in our lives, some disappointment, some pain, and immediately, rather than looking at it as an experience and understanding where it's coming from, what it's doing to us, we just look for someone to blame. Blame another person, often the nearest person at hand. So it's someone close to us who we work with or we live with. Sometimes we blame people further away, like governments, and say, well, how, how we think they should be running the country or how the world should be. But instead of looking at the actual experience itself and the process by which we create suffering in our own thinking and our own emotional activity, we just go straight to the ideals and compare our experience with them and then blame somebody. They should be different than they are. They shouldn't be like this, they should be like that, and so on. So we have this phrase, we say, the way things are. Big part of our meditation is just learning to see the way things are. It's not good, it's not bad, it's just the way things are. As you establish mindfulness, even if you, you're getting caught into some anger or fear or worry, as you establish mindfulness, you can look back and say, this is just the way things are. Maybe it's happened so many times before, it's quite natural, it will happen again. But now you're looking at it from the eye of wisdom and mindfulness. So you're changing that experience rather than buying into it and becoming it, just know, noting it and knowing it as it is. So once you practice mindfulness, it also opens up other possibilities, other ways of looking at your experience or looking at the world. You can change, change the habits of the mind, change the processes by which suffering arises. Go into suffering reduction rather than production. Because your mind is like this sort of empty space, like an empty factory waiting for the, the production manager to decide how he's going to run the system and set everything up and what he's going to produce and so on. It's waiting for that. That's up to us to take that lead 
And our good fortune is we've heard the Dhamma from the Buddha, so we can use some of the wisdom of the Buddha and employ it in our own mind, in our own experience. So it's like a shortcut. If you have a good teacher, it's a shortcut to developing the kind of qualities and the wisdom that helps you to understand yourself better and deal with the world and its problems better. You notice when you're meditating in periods where mindfulness fades away, there's not much clarity, not much strength of mind, not much awareness. And then we start to become more like a victim of our own karmic conditioning. You know, these habits of stress and suffering take over and it's almost like they have their own energy in there. It's almost like a different person pulling us along. And for a while, we we'll get caught into it. And sometimes it's very coarse and very kind of obvious kind of suffering. Say like when you get angry, or, so you get pain in your body and it keeps reoccurring and you keep reacting with anger to it. It's pretty obvious suffering. You say, oh, I don't like this. I don't want this pain. I can't concentrate or the discomfort of feeling tired battling with sleepiness, battling with tiredness in the body. You know, it's pretty obvious kind of suffering. When you're not mindful, you react with negativity, irritation, aversion, and that seems to take over your mind. But other kinds of suffering are you know, more subtle, aren't they? When you have desire for something, you start fantasizing, fantasizing about something you haven't got as you're meditating, you're thinking about food or thinking about a person that you like that you want to be with or a place or a situation that you would like to be in you know, if i got that then i'll be happy if i'm there then things will be good that's also creating the causes for suffering it's also like your mind has been taken over by the this person who's just subtly quietly pulling you away from the present moment from the truth towards suffering. You, know, you one thing is just when you get caught into distraction based on desire, wanting something, liking something, fantasizing or imagining something, uses up a lot of your time and energy, and that gradually wears you out. It also leads to a certain disappointment when that particular mood has finished. You think about it for a while and then then it fades out. You know, it leaves you kind of a what next? And you've lost your energy, lost your concentration. It's like this person, they picked you up, took you for a ride for a while, and then they just dump you. You're there by the side of the road or whatever. It's like, oh, what now? And you're feeling tired and you're feeling annoyed that you let yourself get so caught into the fantasy. And it didn't bring you anything. It didn't make your mind more peaceful, didn't make you wiser, didn't bring you more clarity. Did the opposite. It increased your delusion, increased your attachment. This is one of the experiences we have to keep looking at in teaching ourselves, learning not to keep running with every desire, whether it's a negative desire to get rid of something or based on anger, hatred, fear of somebody or something, or the desire to get something that you haven't got. As you establish mindfulness, you have to keep teaching yourself to let go. And this is the hardest part of letting go. It's particularly you know, letting go of things that bring pleasure with them. At that moment, we don't see the hidden suffering in the pleasure. We don't see the disappointment down the line. We don't see the suffering of accumulating different kinds of attachment and then being stuck there in the mind that gets stuck on things, people, possessions, different experiences stimulus 
we have to establish mindfulness and reflect on that. And this is where Ajahn Chah's teaching of it's not sure, it's not certain. You can bring in, it's so simple. You know, that perceived happiness, how good the thing is, how desirable it is, it's not sure. The pleasure that you may have, it's not sure. It's not that there isn't any pleasure, it's just is it real happiness, lasting happiness, or is it actually part of the cause of more suffering? It's not sure. So sometimes you merge mindfulness and wisdom together. So you're mindful enough to bring up the reflection on the uncertainty of a, a train of thought, a mood. You've got mindfulness and wisdom, you just say it's not sure. Same with aversion and fear. The thing that you fear, the thing you're averse to, it's not sure. Maybe it's not as bad as you think. Maybe it's not such a threat as you think. So little by little, mindfulness and wisdom becomes the refuge of the mind rather than the object that the mind falls into, the desire for or against. And the more you study this and learn about your mind as you meditate, you, know, you can see this, the whole world is, is run by this, run by desire. This is why the Buddha said, you know, Nati, Tanha samanati, there's no river as long as the river of desire. It just floods the whole world and runs the whole world. Because human beings are constantly following desire and they try to control the world according to desire. And that leads us into conflict, competition with others, conflict with others, dissatisfaction within ourselves. Human beings are always mis misunderstanding things and they try to find happiness in controlling the world, making things go according to how their desires want, constantly chasing desire, pushing away anything perceived as, a, say, a threat or something that we don't want, don't like, and then trying to grab hold of and keep and hold on to what we like and what we want. Well, that's on the level of an individual or groups of people or even whole countries. And that's why you get wars, isn't it? For security, fear of others, fear of what others may do to us. So we maybe go to war to try and control another group of people, protect ourselves. Sometimes we're just doing it on within our mind, pushing away thoughts and feelings that we don't like, we go to war with ourselves. Sometimes it's between people, sometimes it's between countries. It's all rooted in desire, following desire, and the desire hijacks the mind, takes over the mind, and takes us endlessly to discontent, dissatisfaction, disappointment. Why is the Buddha not suffering, why is an arahant not suffering, is because they've seen through that process by which desire leads to suffering. And they've established the, the clarity, the mindfulness, the knowledge, the wisdom to not no longer buy into it, follow it. And we can all get a taste of that. When you meditate and you stick with your mindfulness, you know, rather than stubbornly stick with your desire, you stubbornly stick with your mindfulness you can see desire crumble quite quickly, quite often. It's not that there is no such thing as desire. It's just it's no longer, when you're mindful, it's no longer taking over the mind, dominating the mind, bossing you around like some kind of slave owner telling you to go here, go there, do this, do that, think this, think that. Once you develop the, the production line, develops the mindfulness and the wisdom, you have a little bit more choice and more power of your own mind, more strength of mind. And this is, this is where real, real peace comes from. And a lot of people think meditation is simply a kind of a relaxation technique. And of course, that is one part of it, especially if you are particularly stressed about certain things. You can't sleep at night. You can't concentrate, you are feeling agitated, anxious, worried. Well, in the beginning, it is a stress relief 
technique it is helping you to relax and be more at ease with yourself. But that's not the ultimate goal. The ultimate goal is to recognize desire and attachment as the cause of suffering and start undermining them, not giving them free reign to control the mind. And that takes wisdom as well. Simply attaining a state of calm, relaxed awareness, it's, it's good, it's not bad, it's not wrong, but it's not enough. A lot of meditators stop there. They get to the point where they feel calm in themselves. They say, well, this is better than before. And they take that as good enough. You could say it's a form of indulgence or laziness, apathy. And the Buddha said it's really a lack of what we call wiriya, effort or energy in the practice. One attains some peace as well, so especially in sitting meditation, it is very common. You sit and you feel still, you feel calm. And your desires, most of them, certainly the extreme ones, they've abated, gone quiet. So you're enjoying that calm stillness of the body. <coughs> it's relaxed. You're anesthetized almost, you're numb. But then there's a lack of reflection, a lack of development of wisdom at that point. So one's basically taking second best. I feel relaxed, I'm better than before when I was stressed, but not looking closely at the arising of suffering and how craving and attachment causes suffering. This is why Ajahn Chah said, you, know, you have to really investigate, even if you attain a really deep peace of state of mind, peaceful state of mind, what we call samadhi. There's rapture, there's happiness, maybe even one-pointedness, and the mind's let go of all its worries and distractions, it's bright, it's energized, it's peaceful. You have to maintain your vigilance, your mindfulness, and contemplate the arising and passing away of your mental activity, thoughts and feelings, memories. So say you attain a state of peace as you're meditating on this retreat. It could be sitting or walking meditation. Your mind becomes calm. That's the time to main, maintain the mindfulness and reflect. Sometimes I use the word contemplate. Reflect, contemplate on the rising and passing away of thoughts and feelings and sense contact and see the uncertainty in it, the anicca. Or oh, as Ajahn Chah said, it's not sure, it's uncertain. Every thought that comes out of this state of stillness you've att att attained, achieved, there'll be still be thoughts coming out of that. As you come out of this, the quiet, the peace of mind, thoughts arise. That's where you need your mindfulness. The samadhi alone is not the path. Samadhi is practice with right view, right thought, right effort, right mindfulness. It's used as a basis for insight. How does insight arise? It has to come through wise reflection, contemplation, wise observation of the way things are. So if you attain some peace in your meditation, that's good, that's praiseworthy. But then what happens next? Where does your mind go? Say when you finish your meditation this morning, you get up to do something else. What happens at that moment? Where does your, where does your mind go? Maybe it's thinking what next. It's one of the most common things, isn't it? What next? Ah, food. The desire comes up for something. Or maybe you feel pain as you get up from the meditation cushion and there's a, a small aversion there to the pain. Oh, it hurts so much, my knees. This is all desire and attachment re-emerging after that peaceful state. This is where we need to keep vigilant and contemplate. The desire to speak to someone, do something, eat something, think about something, go here, go there. And this is why the Buddha encouraged us to practice mindfulness. Now we use the term mindfulness in daily life. 
But it's just mindfulness, you know, daily life. What is daily life? Well, you know, you're a living, breathing human being. <laughs> that is daily life, whether you're in the morning, in the middle of the day, nighttime, that is daily life. And the Buddha said, maintain your mindfulness and contemplate the impermanence or the uncertainty of phenomena. Thoughts come and go, feelings come and go. So one who maintains and puts effort into maintaining mindfulness through the day or through daily life has a chance to really let go of desire and attachment, really break up this process where suffering and stress is formed in the mind. Because, of course, we can suppress desires and attachments as we meditate. But when you suppress something, it's just waiting to re-emerge, isn't it? So Ajahn Chah said, you know, samadhi is a rock on grass. And we're always landscaping in the monastery and you put rock somewhere and then you pick it up and the grass is yellow. It's died off for a while, but then it very quickly it re-emerges. We get lots of rain here, so it doesn't take long and suddenly you've got green grass again. The rain is desire and attachment. Suddenly your defilements are re-emerging after the samadhi, after the meditation retreat, after the good sit where you got really peaceful and still. Defilements, greed, anger, delusion are ready to re-emerge. So you still need mindfulness afterwards and you still need to contemplate. Take your time as you finish your sit or your walk. Take your time before you get into those other activities or as you're getting into other activities, try to maintain your mindfulness. Use whatever level of mindfulness you've developed. Preserve it as you engage with the world through the day. And the more you practice, the more you will interrupt the habits of mind that are producing suffering. You'll see or experience your moments of clarity, even in the midst of busyness or difficulty or problems that arise. You know, the moments of clarity and mindfulness hopefully will improve and increase through the practice. And even in the midst of a busy day, you might have more mindfulness aware and you notice yourself getting caught into stress or irritation. But there's enough mindfulness to pull yourself back to preserve your precepts and, and to let go of that mood, even when you're busy or very distracted by things. If we don't do this, if we don't practice, then desire and attachment win. They gradually become more and more deeply re rooted in our consciousness. And they affect us over and over again through our life. And as we go towards the end of our life and our body gets a bit weaker, it's even harder to bring up mindfulness and deal with desire and attachment. So just last week I was talking to a doctor who was asking for advice how to help people close to death. Because she saw so many people panicking with unsettled states of mind with fear, anger, anguish, particularly related to past events coming up, people not being able to maintain mindfulness and reflect on their mental activity close to death, so overwhelmed by anguish, fear, panic. She said it was so common to see this and so sad because you know, as human beings we have so much teaching good teaching available to us we have a the opportunity to practice listen to dhamma practice the dhamma through our life but often we through heedlessness through distraction you know we we forget the practice we don't learn to meditate or if we have learned to meditate we let it slip away we forget about it is a, that's another very common one, isn't it? You meet people, middle-aged people in their 40s and their 50s, and they say, oh, when I was young, I used to meditate and listen to Dhamma, and then I had my family and got into my job and you know, forgot all about it. And then when in their 40s or 50s, they start to have a few health problems or relationship problems, and then, then they turn to the Dhamma again. But there's this, been this 20-year gap 
where their desire and attachment was just running wild in their life. It's only by the time they're 40 or 50, maybe they realize and come back to the Dhamma if they're lucky. And some people don't. Things just go downhill and downhill. By the end of the life, the mind is very weak. It doesn't have much mindfulness or insight. It's very sad. People can die with a lot of suffering, mental suffering, not just the physical suffering of the body. The Dhamma is there to counter that, to produce, help us produce the qualities of the path. Mm. Virtuous conduct, mindful conduct, mindful speech, mindfulness, effort, wise reflection, patience, kindness, compassion, all these qualities that you develop through the path. They're coming together to produce a state of mind that is strong, is able to be detached from the pain of the body, even at the end of the life, that is able to focus on the Dhamma, even at the end of life. You might say that's one goal of us, isn't it? To be able to die peaceful, mindful, at ease with a state of mind that's free from regret, free from confusion, anger, fear. The only way you, you can experience that is through practice, learning to train the mind, look after the mind from here onwards. So maybe I'll leave you with those uh, reflections this morning. We've got some time left so that we can carry on uh, meditating together. And Damaya Dhamma Gata Yasa Dutara Dadama Se Sadu 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 Anumodam